a revolutionary product comes along, that changes everything. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. Here it is. Why in the world would Apple Computer want to jump into the handset market with so much competition? Uh, we use all the handsets out there. It's really frustrating. It's a category that, that needs to be reinvented. With over 2 billion units sold, the iPhone is the most influential product of all time. It created the modern smartphone and turned the device into an instant gateway to the world. Everything you desire in the palm of your hand. It changed everything. But where did it come from? If it wasn't a sudden idea from Steve Jobs, who actually came up with the idea? Who were the people that built it? And what are their stories? With the most recent release of the iPhone, it's easy for many people to forget just how revolutionary it once was. Today, we're going to see how it all began and how the pressure of doing the impossible cost some people their marriage and their health. This video will include my exclusive interview with Ken Koshenda, one of the pioneers of the original iPhone. He worked directly with Steve Jobs on the project. This is the secret history of the iPhone. You are watching Tall Fusion TV. To begin our story, we have to go back to the early 2000s. At this time, human-computer interaction was a mess before smart devices. Manipulating digital objects was a chore. In the early 2000s, zooming in on an image usually meant clicking on a menu, selecting the zoom option, and then selecting the amount you wanted to zoom in by. How we zoom in on an image today couldn't be more different. We can simply pinch a screen and manipulate it with our fingers. Back then, such interactions weren't obvious and only became possible with touch screens. Touch screens existed back then, but they were predominantly resistive touch. That's the kind of screen where you have to use a lot of force to touch. Think ATM screens or information screens at train stations and airports. On smaller screens, resistive touch is inexact and frustrating. In the 90s, Apple tried to use resistive touch in a device called the Newton, but it failed. Before even dreaming of a device like the iPhone, this was the first problem that had to be solved. By 2007, the world was looking for a new way to approach the mobile phone. They just needed a company to be in the right place at the right time with the right product. You may be surprised to find out that the first seeds of the iPhone came not from Apple, but from a small company in Delaware called Fingerworks. Founded in 1998 by Wayne Westerman, Fingerworks had figured out how to use a different type of technology effectively. It was called capacitive multi-touch. It was fast, responsive, precise, and most importantly, smart enough to recognize multiple fingers and what they were trying to do. I reached out to Wayne for an interview, but unfortunately, after his company was bought by Apple in 2005, he was whisked away and sworn to secrecy. He couldn't give me any interviews about his work. In the early 2000s, Fingerworks released a trackpad called the iGesture. It helped people with wrist injuries easily use a computer without aggravating their injury. Wayne Westerman, the founder of Fingerworks, had suffered from a wrist condition himself. Sometimes he couldn't type more than a page without his wrist suffering. Instead of despairing, this condition motivated him to innovate new solutions for his university research paper, and this resulted in the Fingerworks technology. Wayne even wrote a simple AI program to help the system understand the differences between accidental and intentional touches. When gestures were performed, the pad would interpret them and turn the movements into computer shortcuts like copy, paste, and scroll. Wayne Westerman and Fingerworks would play a critical role in the development of the iPhone. Here's Ken Koshenda to talk about it a bit more. My name is Ken Koshenda, and for many years I worked at Apple from 2001 until uh, 2017. In 2005, I was asked to join the iPhone project. I had very good experience working with Wayne. But back at the beginning, he had a company called Fingerworks, which is an independent company which Apple bought uh, part for the technology uh, and part to get him because he was so talented. Early on, Steve Jobs hated the idea of Apple making a phone. He was concerned about a lack of focus in the company, a precise issue that he'd solved on his return to Apple in 1997. Steve Jobs believed that a phone would only serve a niche geek market. Cell phones at the time were not the easiest to use, so you can understand why it wouldn't have seemed right for a trendy company like Apple to get into this market. As we all know, this sentiment would later change. Meanwhile, within Apple, a group of engineers and software designers would meet weekly in what used to be a user testing room. They were all from different departments, but united by curiosity and imagination. They realized that the web and digital revolution was bringing richer and ever more complex media to computers. They realized that clicking and typing may not be the best way to navigate this new future. What if there was a more fluid way to interact with content? With this idea, they would start an informal human-computer interaction group within Apple. Their goal was to improve our interactions with technology. One day in 2002, an Apple employee by the name of Tina Huang brought a Fingerworks device to work due to a wrist injury. It was a black rectangular pad that allowed the seamless execution of complicated computer tasks by just the use of her fingers. The Fingerworks touchpad was seen by some curious Apple human interaction employees in their user testing room. Because they were already thinking of new ways to interact with technology, to them, multi-touch interaction was an interesting prospect. Inspired, they whipped up a demo to show Apple's marketing department. Using the multi-touch gesture pad and a projector, they displayed an interactive image of Mac OS. The idea was that you could use finger-based gestures on the pad to manipulate elements of the desktop software. The demo was met with minimal enthusiasm from the marketing team. They just didn't see a need for it, but how could they? There was no product that would really need it. Unfazed, the interaction group continued to have weekly meetings to discuss the possibilities. 
Johnny Ive, who was one of the weekly members of the informal group, had also shown Steve Jobs the concept. Initially, Jobs rejected it. He remarked that it would only be good for, quote, reading something on a toilet, end quote. Johnny Ive, being of a sensitive nature, took the comment personally and was hurt by it. After some further thought, however, Jobs warmed up to the idea and the project would be greenlit, but it became riddled with problems and was ultimately shut down. In July of 2004, Steve Jobs had a surgery to remove a tumor in his pancreas. The realization that he might have a limited time on this planet helped accelerate the timetable of what needed to be done at Apple. About a year ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. I had a scan at 7.30 in the morning and it clearly showed a tumor on my pancreas. I didn't even know what a pancreas was. The doctors told told me this was almost certainly a type of cancer that is incurable and that I should expect to live no longer than three to six months. I've looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I am about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know I need to change something. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. Around this time, Tony Fidel, who led the successful iPod division, suggested to Jobs that it would be a good idea to put Wi-Fi in an iPod. While Jobs thought about it, Tony and his small team would get to work on a new iPod, a PDA hybrid prototype. The result was a disaster. Imagine an iPod with modified software allowing users to navigate the web with a click wheel. Jobs hated it. He understood that it worked, but thought it was a rubbish experience. Jobs told Tony to try another way. In 2005, Bass Auding, a programmer and UI designer, received a call from Steve Jobs asking him to make a demo of a touch interface of a scrolling list. Steve now wanted to do a touchscreen phone. Demos were the way that Apple as a company worked through creative concepts and ideas to see what could be the next product. And then we would make demos uh, and something you could try out right away. And you know, the thing is, these first demos and prototypes are never any good. You know, you think that there is going to be some genius aha moment. But it never works like that. Well, hopefully, there's some little kernel in there. There's some aspect of it that's stronger than other aspects of it. And so you, you go and look for those strong parts. The natural world uses natural selection, generation after generation, improving and improving. In technology, we have creative selection, taking our ideas and building up a product from these humble beginnings. It's a long, iterative, evolutionary process. While Auding was making the contactless demo, he noticed that when scrolling, the text image would suddenly stop when he hit the bottom of the screen. Because of this sudden stopping of all the motion, he thought that his code had crashed. After some time, Auding noticed that he had, in fact, reached the end of the list. This gave him an idea. Why not have the image bounce so that there's some visual feedback that lets you feel like you've reached the end of the list, and not like it's suddenly crashed? This was the genesis of the rubber banding effect on the iPhone. When Steve saw Auding's rubber banding effect for the first time, he realized that a phone could indeed have a touch interface. While work on the scrolling list demo was happening, other touchscreen projects were secretly going on at Apple as well. As cool as these demos were, there were no more than a bunch of disjointed concepts. Some pinching and zooming here, a few widgets there, some notes and the calculator, but nothing with a unified structure. Steve wasn't impressed with the disjointed array of demos. It didn't seem like there was a product to sell. In early 2005, Jobs gave the team two weeks to create something great, and it had to be great, or else. Right. They focused on the vision of a phone and its function. How do you make a phone call on a touch screen? How do you get from a calendar to web browsing? What's the logical flow of getting from one application to another? Amazingly, by the end of the two-week period, they had something to show Jobs. The first time Steve Jobs saw the prototype, he didn't jump for joy or exclaim anything. He was silent. Sitting back, he said, show it to me again. He was, in fact, blown away. The project would be top secret within Apple from that point forward. Around the same time, Apple would purchase Fingerworks, bringing Fingerworks' whole team on board to try and help figure out this new jackpot. So now, Apple had two choices on how to transform this technology into a product. One, enlarge the already successful iPod into a phone, or two, shrink macOS down into a phone using Fingerworks touch technology. Nobody knew which would work best, so Steve let both ideas run. The iPod enlarging team was led by Tony Fidel, and the multi-touch macOS team was led by Scott Forstall. Forstall's team was seen as the underdogs. After all, Tony Fidel had helped push millions of iPod sales and was also working on two smash hits, the iPod Nano and the iPod Video. The battle had begun. Neither team was allowed to know what each other was doing. In fact, the hardware guys weren't allowed to see any software, and the software guys weren't allowed to see any hardware. Hardly anyone working on the phone at Apple knew what the device was going to look like until the keynote, and they weren't given a solid date for that either. During the stress, some members would quit, and others would be fired. At one point, Phil Schiller, head of marketing, had had enough and thought that both projects should be scrapped. An Apple phone with a BlackBerry-style keyboard seemed like the most sensible option. While these projects were going, top Apple executives convinced Jobs that something needed to be 
be done about encroaching MP3 capable mobile phone sales and quickly. Jobs agreed to partner with Motorola, the coolest phone company at the time, with their thin razor phone. They would make an iTunes phone. The idea was people would try out iTunes on the phone and then hopefully go off and buy an iPod. Apple would have no involvement in the hardware, only focusing on iTunes integration. The result was the Motorola Rocker. Already outdated on release, the thing just sucked. I go there and I just resume my music right back to where it was. Well, I was supposed to resume my music right back to where it was. I hit the wrong button. But you can resume your music right back to where it was if you hit the right button. The rocker was so bad that it was soon being returned and at a rate of six times higher than the industry average. Consumers were expecting something big from Apple, and this wasn't it. After the Motorola failure, Jobs returned his attention back to the iPod phone, which was Tony Fidel's team, as it was the safer option. He still did leave the Touch Mac OS team led by Scott Forstall to continue. Tony's team tried a plethora of designs, one of which was similar to an iPod video, but with a phone mode. If you wanted music, it would behave like a regular iPod with touch controls for play, pause, etc. around a scroll wheel. When you needed to dial a number, you would switch it into phone mode and the device would behave like a rotary phone. It wasn't perfect, but Jobs still insisted that the idea could work. Nobody within Apple really knew what this new device was. The iPod team saw it as another portable accessory like the iPod, so software wasn't important. The Touch Mac OS team, on the other hand, saw it as a fully-fledged, multi-touch computer that fit in your hand. Tony Fidel and his team were certain that this new phone should run a beefed-up version of iPod software, while Scott Forstall and his team thought a shrunken-down version of Mac OS would be better. They theorized that mobile chip technology had become powerful enough to run a version of Mac OS. It was jittery at first, but soon they managed to get scrolling to work smoothly on a compact version of Mac OS. And from this point, it was decided that this would be the way to go. The shrunken down version of Mac OS would become known as iOS, and soon, Tony Fidel's iPod phone idea would be abandoned, and all efforts would be focused on iOS. As the software began to take place, details had to be ironed out. How do you unlock this thing without doing it by accident in your pocket? There's actually an interesting story to how this was solved. One day, Freddie Anzers, a user interface designer within Apple, found the solution in the most unlikely of places, a toilet. One day, Freddy was on a US domestic flight and felt the need to relieve himself. He got up from his seat and went to the toilet. As Freddy locked the cubicle door, he happened to observe the locking mechanism. It was so simple. He just slide it to unlock. And that's it. This concept lit a light bulb, and the result was the famous original slide to unlock feature. To test out this concept, an iPhone engineer later gave a prototype to his three-year-old daughter. Without hesitation, she took her finger, slid and unlocked the phone. If a three-year-old could figure it out, anyone could. Meanwhile, Johnny Ive was beginning to imagine what the hardware of this phone could look like. Although later designs would stray, the first sketch from Johnny Ive was close to the final product. He was imagining an infinity pool. Quote, this pond where the display would magically appear. The rest of the device had to get out of the way. End quote. Interestingly, Johnny Ive didn't want a headphone jack in the original iPhone. As the project dragged on, tempers rose within the company due to secrecy, competition, and the time pressure of the project. And it was no wonder. Everything the teams were making was new. Touchscreen technology was in its infancy. The Apple engineers had to figure out how to make a transparent version of multi-touch mass-producible. Untested custom chips had to be developed, cell reception had to be worked out, material designs needed to be perfected. Basically, these teams, which had never made a phone before, were now trying to make the most ambitious device ever imagined. Imagine how it must have been for the developers too. If any app they were working on crashed, it could have been because of virtually a million things, from their coding to any one of the numerous experimental hardware components. In six, the team at Apple still didn't have a CPU, basically the brain of the device, and they were supposed to ship in a year. They decided to contract Samsung, who they'd partnered with previously for chips within the iPod. They asked Samsung if they had any powerful CPUs within certain specifications, and they did, but the only thing Samsung had was from a cable box. Without telling Samsung about the iPhone, Apple said they would need modifications to this chip in just six months. This is much less than half the usual development time for a new chip, and this would later cause problems. By early 2006, the iOS software was making great progress, but the keyboard still sucked. It was just too small to type on, and it failed in all of the demos. Without a good keyboard, the whole phone wouldn't have worked. Realizing that the entire project was in jeopardy, Scott Forstall paused all development of applications on iOS and made everyone focus on the keyboard issue. Everyone on the team built keyboards for three straight weeks. When it came time to test the results of their work, they all still were no good, and there was only one engineer left to demonstrate his keyboard. It was Ken Koshienda. Nervously, he set it up for Scott to type on. Surprisingly, it worked, and it was accurate. The breakthrough was made by using primitive AI to figure out what was actually being typed, essentially predictive text. For example, if you were to type the letter T, there was a high chance you're going to type the letter H next. So the keyboard would make the contact region for H larger without changing the appearance of the button to the naked eye. Ken also had the foresight to use a dictionary to power suggestions and autocorrect. It was clear to me after the first couple of demos that since the screen was so small and since there were no, uh, there was no tactile feedback on the touch screen, that there was going to need to be some new element. Now my first ideas were different shaped keys, different different ways of, of highlighting the keys so that, that you would just 
move your fingers, but that was that was a failed idea. That didn't work. And so it was the dictionary and software assistance, the notion that uh, some code running in the background looking at your touches on the screen and trying to figure out well what did you mean and so combining that notion with the notion of a dictionary and a lot of work and a lot of experimentation gave you know, helped produce that that first result of auto correction for for the first iphone without ken's ideas in that high pressure moment it's possible that the iphone wouldn't have made it off the ground as it was all coming down to the wire for apple disaster struck just three months before the launch, the custom CPU chips from Samsung still had bugs that caused the phones to crash. With such little time left on the clock, it was looking like a catastrophe was in the making. As stress built, engineers started working seven days a week, and some slept in their offices. Tempers flared, and employees shouted at each other. One employee slammed a door so hard out of frustration that the door handle broke, and she got trapped in her office and had to be broken out with a baseball bat. It seemed like the iPhone, which held so much promise, would be Apple's greatest disaster. Other aspects of the iPhone were still being slapped on very late in the product development cycle. One of its killer apps, Google Maps, was only added as an afterthought. On the hardware side, the original iPhone screen was supposed to be plastic like the iPods, but the decision to use glass was made one month after the launch. When the day of the keynote came on January 9th, 2007, none of the team at Apple knew exactly what the final iPhone product would look like, even though they had worked on the project for years. When Steve Jobs took to the stage, some things were still incomplete. The iPhone's buggy CPU issue hadn't been properly solved yet, only patched up for the demo. This meant that the phone could crash at any time during the presentation. The Apple team held their breath, sweating, as they sat and watched Steve Jobs excitedly proclaim, and we're calling it iPhone. There was mostly a positive reaction from the crowd, but also some uncertain laughter, as some thought that Jobs was joking about the name. Yet, the demo was going well. The crowd was loving the smooth scrolling and technological magic they were witnessing. There we go, right there. And to unlock the phone, I just take my finger and slide it across. All right, you want to see that again? Go we wanted something that you couldn't do by accident in your pocket and just slide it across, boom. Well, how do I scroll through my list of artists? How do I do this? I just take my finger and I scroll. That's it. Isn't that cool? Get a little rubber banding up when I run off the edge. We call it the pinch. I can bring them closer together and move them further apart to make it bigger or smaller. And so I can just move them further apart and stretch the image. Cool. And move it around. As Tony Fidel, leader of the iPod phone team, looked on, Steve Jobs did something pretty cruel. When showcasing to the crowd how to delete contact, he gleefully slid Fidel's name off the iPhone contacts list. Tony's changed his number, I gotta update this anyway, so I'm gonna get rid of that, and I can just remove Tony, boom. There we go, it's that simple to edit these things. He was basically saying to Tony, you're fired. Scott Forstall states that during rehearsals of the presentation, Steve would always delete a random contact, never Tony's. To the crowd, it was just a demonstration of how this phone made everything fun and cool to use. To those working at Apple, it was a message. Tony was in trouble. In all of this, there was one glaring omission. Wayne Westerman. Onlookers never knew his name, and Wayne wasn't even invited to the event. But without his multi-touch innovation, there would be no iPhone. Instead, on stage, Steve Jobs stated that Apple had invented multi-touch. These events were a summary of how the project had been for most. Brutal. The project was so hard on the secret teams that it ruined marriages and cost some workers their health. Some employees worked every day, giving up their nights and weekends for years at a time. iPhone engineer Andy Grignon speaks. Quote, the iPhone is the reason I'm divorced. It was probably professionally the worst time in my life. You created a pressure cooker with a bunch of really smart people with an impossible deadline, an impossible mission, and then you hear that the future of the entire company is resting on it. There wasn't really any time to kick your feet back on the desk and say, this is going to be really awesome one day. Every time you turned around, there was some just imminent demise of the program just lurking around the corner. It was especially hard on the married guys. There were a lot of divorces. Oblivious to the sacrifice, the world was electric with the buzz of the iPhone. Oh, that new phone? That new yeah, phone? Yeah, right now. Yeah. You see, yeah. Here we go. Many people were anticipating the Macworld trade show this week, including Andy, and so far they've not been disappointed. The latest from this show, Apple CEO Steve Jobs unveiling what many are calling a revolutionary new product, the iPhone. You scroll this, it's like by flicking like this, it's like a roulette wheel. Go, stop like that. It's just so cool. It's very clear to us that the world's going mobile. And uh, we really believe that, that a device like this, which is you know an order of magnitude more powerful than, than any mobile device or any cell phone that's ever been created, and yet vastly easier to use, is the future. When it was all said and done, keen fans lined up to get one. You paid $500 to secure a spot in this line. No, just to yeah, come and sit here. What are you looking forward to using your iPhone for? Um, just the fact that I can put all my music and everything on there, and it has a touch screen. And I don't know, i seen the commercials, it looks really cool. For me, in 2007, after seeing Jobs' demo of scrolling and gestures, it made sense to me that this was the perfect interface for a small screen device. The iPhone had way more than a thousand times more computing power than NASA did in 1969 when they put man on the moon. Yet it was super easy to use, with a full web browsing experience to boot. Even children could pick up an iPhone and know what to do. Capacitive multi-touch and gestures had broken down the walls of human-computer interaction. 
The future had arrived. Finally, a computer in your pocket. As Apple software engineer Henry Lamarix would put it, quote, we took a Mac and we squished it into a little box, end quote. Other small touches, like a proximity sensor that turned the screen off during a phone call so that it didn't touch your face by accident, and an accelerometer that could sense if you're holding the phone in portrait and landscape, made the whole package feel like magic. Today, it's just so easy to forget just how much of a leap the original iPhone was. What followed the iPhone was a complete shift in how we thought about technology. Now, information and news was instant. We became totally connected all the time. Though in the next decade, this overconnectedness would cause some issues. 这个是一个隐形牙套, the sales of the iPhone would be slow. It would take the introduction of the App Store in 2008 to really kick things off again for Apple. If it wasn't for the App Store, the iPhone could have just been one of those devices that looked cool and was cool to use, but never caught on. For an entire year after the iPhone's launch, it could run a grand total of 16 apps. There was only one home screen's worth of apps, and that was it. And this isn't to mention how limited the iPhone was compared to some other devices out there. They had no multimedia messaging, no video camera, no cut and paste, no 3G, and the list goes on, but that wasn't important. Nokia, BlackBerry, and the rest of the established phone companies had been providing these features for many years. But the difference was, for the first time, the device was now a changeable blank canvas with no buttons. Since the device could run apps on it, the iPhone software creators could make it whatever they wanted it to be. Their creativity was only limited by their imagination and the hardware capability. Today, billions of apps have been sold, and the mobile app space has become a new industry. Companies like Nokia, BlackBerry, and Palm thought they knew the game, but they couldn't visualize the future. They thought things would never change, and before they realized, it was too late to prosper in this brave new world. Google was working on their own BlackBerry-style phone with a hardware keyboard, but when they saw the iPhone presentation, they abandoned that idea and went for full touchscreen. The result was the very first Android phone. But that's a story for another day. As the years passed, people became less and less excited with each new release of the iPhone. Maybe we've reached the point where the devices are just so good there's only incremental improvements we can make. I asked Ken what he thought of Apple's direction, and he stated that if he was perfectly happy with Apple, he wouldn't have left in 2017, but he hopes that they continue to innovate. As as we all know, Apple isn't the only game in town anymore. Competition is much stronger than ever before. Well, maybe the next big thing from Apple is around the corner, but at this stage, only time will tell. The story of the original iPhone is one of great sacrifice, risk, and reward. A story that shaped technology and the world as we know it. It gave the average person an interface to almost infinite information and knowledge, all in the palm of their hand. But sadly, almost nobody knows who invented these technologies and what the cost was to innovate such a device. To finish off, we'll have some words from Ken. I hope that you all use technology and, and enjoy it. Some of the products that maybe that I made are useful and meaningful to you and um, uh, bring you some joy in your life. If, if they do, then I've done my job. In all of this, something has to be said for Steve Jobs. He may not have invented the technologies, and Ken told me he wasn't the nicest person to work for. But Steve did care about making great products, and he would push people and squeeze the very best out of them to make these products happen. And in that vein, without Steve, there also would be no iPhone. If you've watched this video to the end, thank you, I appreciate it. I hope you can now look down at your iPhone or the other smartphones that followed and appreciate how they came to be. If you want to see more video documentaries from my book, New Thinking, there's a playlist below. If you are new here, you can subscribe so you don't miss out on more videos like this in the future.